Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and Cable Reloaded, issue number one, and only, apparently, which is sad, because I really like this comic book. It says a lot about the idea that we're able to take a self-contained story that's actually part of a larger story, and still keep it self-contained, and a larger part. I'm going to explain that in a hot moment. First, let's give credit where credit's due. So this is issue one, and I believe only, call in the big gun. Al Ewing is the writer, Bob Quinn on art, Java Tartaglia on colors, and VCs Joe Sabino on letters. Uh, Tom Mueller doing the design. There's a Liefeld variant cover, and that's actually going to be fairly important after, of course, uh, Stefano Caselli and Israel Silva does the cover art. And Jonathan Hickman still currently the head of X, so... Interesting, because with Bob Quinn, I've seen him on a couple Marvel things before. He's also done a Red Sonja before. And his art has always been something where I look at and I go, eh, you know, not bad. No complaints, right? But when I stare at this, I see that there's some things here, and this is important because it comes up. It reminds me a little bit of Liefeld's art. Now, obviously, nobody can actually replicate <laughs> Liefeld. He's just got a this incredible self-taught, no formal schooling for it whatsoever, millionaire kind of a style, right? Now, for the most part, I think I think your average person will argue that Liefeld's art isn't great, but the poses, and you can see what he was trying to do, and it was really great. <laughs> I mean, really good on a grand scale. And for anybody who, of course, hates Liefeld, I mean, psh, this is the guy who just, you know, while he's sitting there in his chair with a big old smile from ear to ear with a fistful of your girlfriend's hair, oh, he'll roll one tonight for your sorrow. He don't care. <laughs> you guys have a problem with him. He has no problems with it. He's sitting back collecting his million-dollar checks for Deadpool and everything else that he's done, including Cable. Ewing gets a hold of this art, or excuse me, this uh, story. And I was pretty impressed with this one, because I'm not going to say that Ewing is hit or miss, but he's more of a miss or knock at the hell out of the ballpark. And that's kind of what he does here, right? For the most part, this was a Babe Ruth walking up and, pointing toward the center field, you know, out um, the, the stands and uh, past center field. Blech. Anyhow, the idea that this is a self-contained story, boom, this little thing, nothing that happens in here is going to continue. The story will, but the characters won't, right? Unless it's actually a part of something else like Ewing's Guardians of the Galaxy, or one of the other stories that he's telling. And that's actually pretty important in here, because there are several stories being told. This whole uh, new Annihilation Wave story, this actually has something to do with what Ewing has been doing with his Guardians of the Galaxy specifically, but almost all of his other books, sans the uh, Immortal Hulk, I don't think there was a lot to do there. But I wouldn't be surprised if, and it would only make sense if uh, Omega Flight showed up at some point, right? Anyway, this particular team in here is Cable, um, Abigail Brand, she's in the background, and I like how these two are kind of butting heads with each other. Cannonball and Boom Boom are in this, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, and there's the mention of, hey, we're getting back X-Force, right? Eh, Feral ain't there and Warpath ain't there. I want to hear it. You know, say a little sunspot, even though he left at some point. No, 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 no. I want to see Shatterstar. It's got to be the whole thing. You don't get to call yourself a partial team reformation. No, this is something else. But they do decide to call it Exterminators, not just because Wizkid is in here. I like what's happening here because Ewing is giving us Big Daddy Cable again. He's taken over for little punk ass bitch. Um, uh, what do you call him? Babel. <laughs> That's what uh, Deadpool called him at one point. Babel. And I like this because the stuff that happened still happened. It's not just a complete retcon. It's more of a, let's pencil this stuff in. Let's give us back the character who everybody loved so much, right? And we did. We love Adult Cable. I adore, love Adult Cable. 
little squirt cable and kiss my left butt cheek and make the right one jealous. But he takes the story that's happened so far and character interactions, like his interactions this whole time with uh, Wizkid. Cable almost deified Wizkid. And Wizkid just looked down at this kid like, well, who are you? Get away from me, right? And this continues, even though it's old man Cable. Wizkid still hasn't gotten out of the idea of, yeah, you're still Cable. You still looked up to me at one point. It's cool and interesting that Cable is remembering the things that he did when he was baby Cable. Of course, that would only make sense, but not in the Marvel Universe. It's showing you how things are changing, right? How going into the past or the future or whatever isn't just going into a different timeline, but also it's a different reality. And every time you do something like that, there's a new reality that kind of branches off from your original one. You can, you know, for the most part, always get back to where you came from. But you can never really go to your future, just a possible future, right? Anyway, uh, Cora, the burning heart, is in here also. And it's interesting to see her using her powers. And you get to see a lot of her mentality and her mindset. Anybody who would ask for help where I come from is, you know, you're doomed, right? Lila Shenny is in here also, and that was cool. And the biggest surprise to me, I guess, even though it shouldn't have been, is that Rocket Raccoon came out. They say Rocket Raccoon, but on here, Cable says something very important. He calls him Ranger Rocket. Ranger Rocket is what Rocket Raccoon was originally called in that Incredible Hulk first appearance. See, now the trick is, that is not actually the first appearance. It's the first appearance of the character of, you know, Rocket Raccoon. That was when he was a space ranger. He'd go out and he'd kick butt and, you know, all the different hybrid animals and cyborg animals and whatnot, right? This is pretty radically different. See, the second appearance of Rocket Raccoon in the comics, and this is only something that us no-life comic book nerds, you know, like me, would know about right? The second appearance of Rocket is our Rocket. The other Rocket is actually Hulk going into a future timeline, whatever, and sees this dude and, oh, hey, took this out. It was actually, through Retcon, it's not the original Rocket Raccoon. That's the original Rocket Raccoon, but the one that we have is a different timeline one who's very sarcastic. He's a total jerk, you know? Um, so it's interesting to see that kind of dynamic on here. Anyway, there's a lot in here, and you have to really read this stuff to, to get the stuff that happens, the references that are happening here. It's interesting that his one um, uh, AI, he uses two AIs here. One of them is Little Nicky. Yeah, Adam Sandler from that devil movie that he did. Dumb movie, but interesting reference there. Also, the original, or the first um, AI that he's using there's a conversation about riding a, or about, what is it? A big, ah, I, I, I can't give it away. I'm not going to give it away because it gives away, it spoils the hell out of the ending of the, the book. There's a lot of callbacks in this. Cable asks, do you know what's in my pouches? And he tells you what he keeps in his pouches. Then it comes up again towards the end of the book. What also comes up at the end of the book is why the one AI was riding the thing that she was riding. No, it wasn't that, you know, sicko. It's the idea that she was riding something. And it gave me, you guys should know which character it gave me the vibes of. Guys, please mention it in the comments below. That's not a safe space, but I can't just go around spoiling uh, everything that happens in this comic book. I dug the little references and the little callbacks that would happen later on in the comic, you know, as the comic progressed. I I attribute the word genius to uh, Mr. Ewing an awful lot. I know that I do. But that being said, it's really fitting. You know, I can imagine, what is it, the Odyssey and the Iliad? The heck was his name? Homer. You know, Homer originally told his stories, those two stories, in a bar, you know, and people would just come in nightly to hear the stories and whatnot. Yeah, meanwhile, I could see Ewing in the exact same timeline making, like, 
cave wall comic book drawings, <laughs> right? Um, he's not a terrible artist, damn it. But the idea is that I could see him doing something. I could see him writing the epics of Gilgamesh, you know, on, on that stone in that cave someplace. Ewing just has this ability to take everything that we've had before and repackage it and hand it back and say, do you approve? And yes, sir, we do. Everything that happens in this comic book, keep looking in the background. Everything that happens, look at the body language. Everything that happens, read what's being said. It's wicked cool, if you don't mind me borrowing something from the, the Bostonians, people from Massachusetts, New England, wicked. It's amazing. To see him you to just do so much in one self-contained comic book. This is part of a larger story, and what happens in here is clearly going to have a direct um, impact on other stuff, but for right now, we're not going to see this team again. It, I don't know what else is coming after this, except for, of course, what they put at the end of this book and the dates that they're giving those things. But I look at this and I'm just surprised. I'm shocked. Ewing continually gives us good stories. Sometimes he misses. Everybody misses. You know, you come at the king, you better not miss, right? Sometimes he does miss. <laughs> but when he's... When he is on, man, it is just every time, boom, right out that ballpark. Just hitting the vans, you know, and having the, the tailgate party outside in the parking lot. It is incredible to see some of the stuff that he can do to fit so much in one small little space, like 20 to, 20 to 22 pages of a comic book. Always impresses me. Guys, make sure you uh, grab this one, and it looks like I'm going to have to go back and forward and grab some of these Annihilation, the last Annihilation comic books, because they actually do seem pretty interesting right now. It's funny how one book can do that for you, right? Anyway, guys, I'm out, and I'll talk to you later. Like the video, watch an ad. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.